Thank you, Liz. That was beautiful. It's always good having you home. Share your talents with us. Happy New Year, everybody. It is good to see you all. Uh, there's a few missing from our number. Uh, I think there's been, been sickness going around, and I'm, ass I'm assuming that's where some of our our regulars are, but it's good to see some new faces here today, uh, some people I don't recognize, so I look forward to meeting you afterwards. It's good to be back in town, kind of. Uh, my wife and I were able to get away for a little while uh, over uh, Christmas and New Year's uh, to spend time with my family, and uh, we had a very good time uh, in cold Arizona. I see a couple other Arizonans back in town again. Uh, Lori and Jamie, good to have you. And um, yeah, I was surprised how cold it was. We had a couple of mornings when we woke up and it was below zero in Arizona. I uh, didn't think it was going to be that, quite that cold. I did optimistically take one pair of shorts just in case, but I never got to put them on. Um, but that's all right. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, bow our heads for prayer. Father God, we just thank you for uh, this time that we can come together as we open your word now, as we uh, draw closer to you, or we just pray that you would draw closer to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The title of today's sermon uh, is aptly uh, entitled, A Fresh Start. And uh, it's got many meanings today. Um, the fresh start of a new year, um, but I also hear in a few minutes we're going to be um, celebrating uh, the Lord's communion as well and uh, the fresh start that that also symbolizes in our lives. At the beginning of a new year, we often try, uh, usually feebly, uh, to do something new or different. And we call these resolutions, right? Uh, we take uh, this time at the beginning of each new year to begin again. And maybe, uh, maybe it's our chance to begin a new workout routine uh, because it didn't work last year. We're going to try over again this year. Or maybe it worked just fine and we were going to up the ante a little bit. I don't know. Uh, maybe you've, uh, maybe some of you have, uh, are, are trying out a new resolution of reading through your Bible the, uh, from cover to cover throughout this year. Um, sometimes, um, I know I've tried that in the past and uh, had Mixed success, I suppose. Uh, maybe you resolve to uh, exercise more this year or uh, work on becoming debt-free. Maybe that's your resolution this year. Or maybe you uh, want to complete that renovation on your home that you've been wanting to do for so long. Or maybe you're excited to move into a new home this year. Or maybe you want to buy that new car that you've always wanted. Or maybe in some cases, desperately need some of us resolve to start our day with God in a way that we maybe we have never done before. Or maybe we just want to try something new that we've never tried before this year. It doesn't matter uh, what angle you take on New Year's resolutions, whether you're uh, fundamentally opposed to setting resolutions or not. Uh, I guess I used to do that, but I don't do that so much anymore because... <laughs> I just, I figured uh, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. If I don't, I don't. Life, though, is full of fresh starts. And I think the uh, new year is a time to often think about a fresh start. But throughout the year, we, we, and throughout our lives, we have all kinds of fresh starts. Maybe you're starting at a new school. Maybe it's the first day at a new job or having your first baby, moving to a new town or a new state, or maybe it's being newly married, or venturing into the unknown of a new relationship. Life is full of new beginnings, fresh starts, if you would. But there is no fresh start that can compare with meeting Jesus and being given being given new life in him. And today I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk about a story, one such story that is found in Scripture in John chapter 8. And the story actually begins in verse 3. Our Scripture reading today was uh, verses 10 and 11. But I want to back up a little bit. 
So if you have your Bibles, and I apologize, I don't have um, the PowerPoint for the screen today, so you're going to have to pull out your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible today, there's a pew Bible in front of you. Feel free to grab that and open it up to the book of John, uh, and we're going to be looking at chapter 8, verses, uh, starting in verse 3. And the Bible reads this. The scribes and the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, to Jesus, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. They didn't care about this woman at all. Whether she was hurt or not doesn't matter. They were looking to bring Jesus down. So Jesus bent down. And man, I would have loved to have been there. <laughs> In a way, I guess maybe not. That would have been a very traumatic experience. But I want to find out someday. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask, Jesus, what did you write in the sand? What did you write on the... Because it says here that he bent down in verse 6 and he wrote with his finger on the ground. Now it's speculated uh, as to what he could have written there. Uh, Maybe he was writing down the sins of the men that had gathered around to stone this woman. Um, Maybe he was writing down the Ten Commandments. Um, I, I, I don't know. Whatever he wrote, though, it shook those people to their core. And verse 7, And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. He continued writing. But when they heard it, They went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And verse 10 says, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This woman who was caught in the very act of adultery was given a fresh start by Jesus himself. And unable to stand before Jesus sinless, all of her accusers sulked away. It's quite an uh, exciting story in a way where you have the, the traditional good guy, bad guy type of thing going on where Uh, The oppressed is um, freed and the oppressors are shamed. I think in part, part, that's why we like stories so much and why the Bible is filled with them. It's because we can relate. They speak to our hearts in ways that mere words do not. We find here an example in this story of Jesus providing a fresh start to a woman who honestly didn't deserve it. Not for anything she had done. But then again, how many of us (laughs) can honestly say that we deserve a fresh start from God? I know I can't. I can't say that. I can't claim deserving anything from God. It's truly a gift, truly something that is meant to change our hearts once it is received. One of the early founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White, she writes about this adulterous woman in her book, Ministry of Health and Healing. And she writes this, Her heart was melted, and bowing at the feet of Jesus, she sobbed out her grateful love, and with bitter tears confessed her sins. This was to her the beginning of a new life. I love that line. This was to her the beginning of a new 
life. A life of purity and peace devoted to God. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater... Listen to this. This is fantastic. Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. Did you hear that? In uplifting this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. He cured the spiritual malady that leads to eternal death. This penitent woman, this woman who was sorry for what she had done, became one of his most steadfast followers. There is something about experiencing the saving grace of Jesus that changes our hearts. God's grace compels action. And several weeks ago, I, I, I shared in a sermon that uh, faith comes with action, right? Faith and works uh, are hand in, go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And that message still rings true, even in this story. The grace of Jesus that he poured out onto this woman that he so freely gave to her was not without an expectation of action. God's grace compels action. It doesn't demand it so much as it just wells up within us. It compels us to take steps forward and not backwards. The natural response to such undeserved grace and forgiveness is actually discipleship. Oftentimes we don't think about it in these terms. We, we think of God's grace and we think of uh, his blood covering us and, and making us white as snow as, as TJ shared in the children's story this morning. And, but we don't often think of what's the next step? Once I've received this life-changing grace of God, what's the next step? And the, the natural next step is actually discipleship, is to go and to share and to bring this grace to others who are also desperately in need of it. We can see this very thing actually take place as this woman is drawn to Jesus and becomes one of his most steadfast followers. Now I imagine that this woman, perhaps in some ways, I, this is my imagination, it's not, uh, it doesn't say it explicitly in scripture or anything like that, so take it as you will. But I imagine that this woman experienced the fast track uh, of the AA 12-step program. In a way, uh, and I, for those of you that are not familiar um, with uh, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, they've come up with many different um, versions of it uh, for uh, Narcotics Anonymous and many others. But for your benefit, I printed out uh, the 12 steps, the abbreviated 12 steps of the AA 12-step program. Now, AA's 12-step approach follows a set of guidelines designed as steps, if you would, towards recovery. And members can revisit these steps at any time throughout the process and throughout their lives. And here are the 12 steps. The first step is this. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. And of course, I'm going to be, it's AA, so alcohol is there. But um, maybe in, your, in the back of your mind, insert. Uh, insert whatever it is uh, in your life that is, is what you struggle with. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. I think this woman would admit that her life had become unmanageable, being dragged into public, humiliated, um, most likely half-naked if she had been caught in the very act of adultery. Her life had become unmanageable. And kneeling before Jesus, I'm sure she was quite willing to admit that. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step three, made a decision to turn our will 
and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Deeply searching within ourselves. What am I doing? What is my life all about? What is God calling me to? Step five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Well, this woman had the benefit of uh, admitting to herself and to another human being who also happened to be God, <laughs> lying at his feet, the exact nature of her wrongs. Step six, we, we're entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. It's one thing just to admit it, but are we ready to give it up? It's one thing to admit where we have come, fallen short and gone wrong, but are we willing, willing to have God remove these defects of our character? Step seven, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Step eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Now, I don't know that this, the Bible doesn't share the rest of this woman's story. It's, it's actually just quite brief. But after she left Jesus' presence, I can't help but imagine that she went to make things right for those that she had hurt. Was it her family? Her neighbors? I don't know. Step nine. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Step ten. Continued to take personal inventory. This is a revisitation, a, a if you would, a, uh, a health checkup, a, a status checkup. Continued to take personal inventory, and when we were uh, wrong, promptly admitted it. Because here's the thing. Coming to God, coming to Jesus, receiving forgiveness, receiving His grace, does not mean that the rest of your life is going to be perfect. I think all of us here, and every single person sitting here, and myself standing here, can, can understand and relate that, okay, yeah, I had a moment in my life when I gave myself fully to Jesus. I gave myself fully to God. But then life happens. Sin creeps back in. We stumble. We fall. Life is filled with challenges. And we are so desperately in need of fresh starts quite often, probably more often than we would like to admit. Step 11. Almost done sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. There's a profound, recollect or there's a profound recognition in this step that we are powerless to do this by ourselves. We are powerless to overcome sin in our lives by ourselves. We are in desperate need of a power greater than ourselves. Here, that's God, Jesus. And finally, step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Who did this woman go to? Who did she witness to? Were there others that she knew who were living similar, a similar life of sin that she so desperately wanted to go and introduce to the message that Jesus was giving to her? This message of grace and salvation? In January 2014, Outlook magazine, some of you received that magazine, 
was focusing on discipleship. And I found this quote that defines succinctly what true disciples look like. It says this, A disciple of Christ focuses on pleasing Christ in every area of life. Disciples put off self-centeredness and put on Christ-centeredness. Now, there's many different definitions of disciples out there and discipleship. Um, in many ways, it should impact every area of our lives, every area of our church. Every ministry within our church should be uh, a focus. There should be a, an underlying focus of discipleship. As this adulterous woman experienced the love and the saving power of Jesus, she forsook her self-centeredness and became a new person, a devoted disciple of Jesus, completely Christ-centered now. Her encounter with Jesus compelled her, there's that word again, compelled her to action. Any other course of action would have seemed wrong or, and maybe even foreign her old way of doing things, her old life seemed distasteful now after meeting Jesus. As we begin a new year, let us be reminded that a fresh start is within each one of our grasps because we have been saved. We are saved by grace. And that saving grace comes only from Jesus. And no matter what we have done or said, whether it's throughout the, our whole past life or even just this last year as we're reflecting on 2019 and wanting to have a better version of ourselves for 2020, no matter how wrong we have been, what we have said or done, may each of us find new life and a, and a fresh start in Jesus, we cannot do this on our own. Like this woman caught in adultery, powerless to help herself in many ways, condemned by the world, condemned by those who were supposed to have been leading her on a path of righteousness, found herself helpless unable to take any steps forward, but only to fall at the feet of Jesus and plead for mercy. And that is exactly what she found, mercy and grace. Jesus is calling each one of us to be his followers, to be his disciples. Not tomorrow, not, not, not next week, not next year, but today. Today. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We have nothing to lose when we come to Jesus seeking a fresh start, seeking Jesus' face in a new year, a new year of opportunities, a new year of love, and service to our King. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the fresh start that you offer us on this new year, on this first Sabbath of 2020. And God, as we separate here in just a moment, and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, may we be reminded of the cleansing and the fresh start that you so freely offer to us, not just at the beginning of New Year's, but day after day, we can come to you. And for that, God, you are worthy to be praised. I pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to uh, demonstrate uh, our acceptance of the sacrifice that Jesus so freely made on our behalf.
Uh, and here we, uh, we celebrate communion, first by separating uh, and uh, finding a partner. Maybe it's with your family or your spouse or uh, men if you'd like to ask another man in the church or women if you'd like to ask another woman in the church um, to wash each other's feet. Uh, this was something that Jesus encouraged his followers to follow his example after he washed his disciples' feet. For those of you who struggle with uh, navigating the stairs, we do have a room off to the side here where you can um, take part. Uh, and for everyone else, there's families and couples uh, down in the fellowship hall downstairs. And at the base of the stairs across the hall, uh, the men will have their own room and right around the corner, the women um, can meet in there. And after a few minutes, we'll, we'll meet back up here uh, to partake of the, the bread and the juice that uh, will be provided. And we'll explain a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So you may disperse, but we'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Thank you. <coughs> 